This this conference will now be recorded. Okie dokie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Hooved Animal Humane Society's Saturday Seminar Series. We're so glad you're joining us today. Our speaker today is Heather Boschman, who is a full-time farrier who practices in Northern Illinois. She is a certified journeyman farrier with a therapeutic endorsement from the American Farriers Association and the first woman in the state of Illinois to achieve this. Congratulations. Her first book, The Hoof Book, An Owner's Guide to Demystifying Hoof Care, debuted this week as the number one new release in equestrian sports on Amazon. Take it away, Heather. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here and thanks for having me. Um, a second here, I should be able to pull up my screen and show you all my uh, my slides and everything. <laughs> there we go. Let's see. Here we go. All right, are you all seeing my uh, my screen now? Yes. All right, perfect. All righty. Get the little pointer here so we can uh, see everything well. All right, so thank you all for having me and um, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I titled this Need to Know Hoof Care for the Conscientious Horse Owner. And I know the fact that all of you are here is um, indicative of the fact that you are conscientious and you do want to do the very best for your horses that you can. And I think that's most horse owners, like most people really do care for their animals and want to do the best they can. Um, so if there's anything in this presentation that you didn't know, and all of a sudden you feel like a really bad horse person, don't feel that way. That's that's why we do educational things. That's why you're trying to learn. Um, nobody knows these things until someone tells them. So, you know, don't, uh, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty here. This is uh, just a learning, learning thing for everybody. Um, and thank you so much to Haas for putting all this on. And I think that's a great, uh, great series that they're doing. So join the rest of their uh, wonderful talks that they're planning. <laughs> um, all right, so this is uh, this is who I am. Um, I've been a full-time farrier for 11 years. Uh, after I went through trade school, I then did a one-year apprenticeship in Northern Illinois and then went to uh, the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine for a one-year podiatry internship. Um, after that, I did uh, achieve the Certified Journeyman Farrier and the Therapeutic Endorsement from the American Farriers Association. Um, so those are both uh, voluntary certifications. Um, in the US, we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later, but in the United States, there's no mandatory certification for farriers. So any farrier that you see with letters after their name um, basically decided to go after that on their own. Um, and then I was in 2018, I was the Edward Martin Cultural Exchange recipient. So that's a program between the American Fairs Association and the British Fairs and Blacksmiths Association, where um, we'll send a farrier over there and they send a farrier over here and you'd get to uh, travel around and work with a different farrier every week for essentially the whole summer. So it's a three month exchange. Um, and that was just a, a wonderful learning experience. And that's where this picture was taken was over in, uh, in England. Um, and, uh, then after I came back from that, I became the communications chair for the American Farriers Association. So you will hear a little bit about the American Farriers Association today. I am a little bit biased on that account. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, just a little bit about myself and, um, yeah, the, the main, I mean, I'm just a farrier, like every other <laughs> farrier that you see out there. Um, and a lot of the other farriers that you'll meet out there have also, you know, pursued a lot of these sources of continuing education and uh, 
you know, we, we all really care about our craft and our trade. So it's, uh, that your farrier can be a really good resource for um, questions that you may have, you know, after this, if there's something that you have a question about specifically about your horse in relation to the things you learned today, your farrier can be really helpful on that account. Um, so we'll jump right in. Um, obviously, since all of you are here today, you realize that it is important for you to know something about hoof care. Um, but uh, you are you are ultimately the one that's responsible for your horse's health and happiness. So we all know that you know the phrase "no foot, no horse." Um, it's it's really true. If you've ever had a horse that had severe hoof problems, you know that that just is a whole can of worms. As soon as their feet are in bad shape, nothing else is working correctly. They're uncomfortable. I mean, you can have horses that colic because they're having hoof problems. It's uh, it's all connected and building that foundation in a solid way is extremely important to the health of your horse in general. Um, a lot of these things might seem like relatively small things like, you know, oh, a little distortion here, a little flare there. It's not that that little distortion or flare is going to kill your horse. Um, it's just that all these small things together add up, you know, you get one structure that's a little bit weakened and then you get a little bit of extra load on it and you know you can end up with a breakdown um and then lastly you are you are your horse's advocate and i think you are all probably very aware of that fact that uh, of all the people in the world you are the one that cares the most about your horse and you want to make sure that they are getting the best care that they can and that they are happy and healthy um so ultimately it's important for you to understand what's going on with them so that you can advocate for them and you can make informed decisions uh, regarding their care. So we're just gonna do a little anatomy review to uh, set the stage for some of the things we're going to talk about later. Um, so we have three bones that are inside the hoof capsule. So we have the coffin bone, which is um, the bone that's closest to the ground. And then the navicular bone, which is that bone that we pretty much only hear about when your horse gets navicular disease. Um, and then the short pastern bone. So you can see here's the coffin bone. This is a cross section freeze dried limb here. And then this is your navicular bone back here. And then this is the short pastern here. So your hoof capsule basically goes, you know, down here. Um, so as you can see, the navicular bone, that's a very small bone in the relation to the size of your whole horse. Um, it's probably about the size of your thumb in an average size, you know, let's say a thoroughbred, uh, your, your coffin bone is probably, or I mean, your navicular bone is probably about the size of your thumb. Um, but it can be extremely important if it, uh, if it's not functioning properly. Um, so the, uh, the coffin bone is here. Um, it should be all the way around the outside edge of this coffin bone your white line grows. So when you're looking at the bottom of your horse's hoof and you see a white line that's just inside the hoof wall, so here's your hoof wall, here's your white line, that's going to be a pretty good indicator of the shape of the coffin bone that's inside your horse's foot. Um, so uh, these three bones fit together to make the coffin joint and this uh, the navicular bone helps add surface area to the coffin joint in the back half. And we all know when you're talking about all of the weight of a horse coming down on this, a little more surface area to spread out that load is going to be a good thing. It's going to reduce the pounds per square inch that's going on um, the coffin joint in general. So the, I promise the navicular bone does do helpful things. <laughs> it just also causes some breakdowns. Um, So there's also a lot of other structures that are going on inside the hoof capsule besides just these three bones. Um, so we have the digital cushion, which is in the back half of the hoof here. It's this large white blob back here. Um, so it is a shock absorbing structure. It's primarily made up of, um, of collagen fibers. So the same thing that cartilage is made out of and then uh, fat as well. So um, this is one, one spot where fat is actually a good thing in your horse. 
Um, and so that helps absorb a lot of shock as all of this weight is descending on this bony column here. Everything pushes back into this nice soft fat pad here. And you'll see even, uh, so here's the heel bulbs on this horse. If you, uh, you know, next time you go out and pick your horse's feet, you can push your thumbs right back here and you'll be able to actually feel uh, that nice soft squishy pad in there. Um, some horses have a really large, um, really robust digital cushion back here. And those ones you'll be able to feel really easily. Um, some horses have a smaller, flatter, more compressed um, digital cushion. And those you're going to have to push your thumb in a little further to find, but I promise it is still there. Um, and then we have the collateral cartilages. So those are cartilage plates that are attached to the back half of the coffin bone, and they add flexibility to the back half of the foot. So the way that the hoof is designed to function, the front half is pretty stable. It doesn't, doesn't have a ton of movement. It does have a little bit, but not a ton. The back half is designed to open and close. So when your horse pushes down and bears weight on this, the heels move apart slightly and all of these bones here can drop back a little bit. It just gives them a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more room to move. Um, so if this was a perfectly hard, um, inflexible area back here and these bones came back, you would end up with hard surface on hard surface and it would be quite uncomfortable for your horse. But uh, luckily the back half of the hoof capsule is designed to be flexible. So those cartilages, which come off of the back of the coffin bone, they'll be kind of in this area and they are essentially a flexible sheet. So they'll push out and then come back in and that helps um, pump some of the blood back out of the limb and um, adds some shock absorption to it. Uh, and then the deep flexor tendon uh, attaches to the coffin bone in the back here. So this is the attachment point for the deep flexor tendon and then it runs over the navicular bone here and then just keeps on going right up the leg. Um, so the deep flexor tendon is the tendon that is primarily responsible for flexing the leg. Um, so as your horse is moving, um, you go, you know, they're weight bearing and then you go through breakover. So that's the point at which the foot starts moving forward. And that movement forwards is all this little tendon right here. Um, so that is an extremely important tendon for your horse to be able to move normally. Um, and that's why when we do have navicular issues here by the deep flexor tendon, it's, it's very painful because there's just all of this pressure every time that your horse moves forward. Uh, we also have the common extensor tendon that attaches to the coffin bone. So this is the attachment point here. And then the tendon runs right up the front of the leg and it has other minor attachment points to uh, the short pastern and then up to the long pastern. Um, and then it continues on up the leg. Uh, so that one, that tendon is responsible for extending the leg primarily. So um, once the hoof has broken over and your horse is starting to move that leg forward and it's swinging forward in the air, that swing motion is what this extensor tendon is there for. Um, and then we also have a lot of ligaments that are in the hoof. So we have collateral ligaments, which go on either side of every joint in your horse, and those hold the joint closed and keep it moving only in one direction rather than moving in multiple directions. Um, because most joints are designed, unless it's a ball and socket type of joint, they're primarily designed to move in one direction. So those little ligaments help with that. Um, we also have a number of navicular ligaments. So there's one ligament that attaches Right here, you can see um, that's the impar ligament, and that attaches the bottom of the navicular bone to the coffin bone, and that helps keep it from just being pulled away when the deep flexor tendon pulls over it. And then we also have the suspensory ligament of the navicular bone, which attaches on the top and either side of the navicular bone, and it goes all the way up to here and attaches. Um, suspensory ligament of the navicular bone being a completely different ligament than the suspensory ligament that we hear about so much. Uh, and then we also have ligaments uh, connecting the collateral cartilages to all these other structures that we've just talked about. Um, so there is a lot going on inside that little hoof capsule. Um, so this is a uh, cadaver leg, um, 
no no horses were harmed in this uh, in this picture taking um and then the hoof capsule was removed from this cadaver leg so uh, there is a ton of sensitive structures that are inside there as well as all of those bones and then tendons and ligaments and cartilages and cushions um, we also have a huge number of blood vessels, uh, arteries, capillaries, veins, venous plexuses, which is basically a large network of veins that um, keep blood in a certain area. And then aviations, which are arteriovenous anastomoses. Um, so that is a special feature that horses hooves have that a lot of other creatures don't have, where um, they can essentially send blood directly from the artery to the vein and just completely skip the capillaries. Um, so when you have a situation with a ton of inflammation, um, like in laminitis, for instance, those shunts can keep some of that blood out of the hoof. So it helps reduce a little bit of that inflammation. Um, so that's all going on in there. Um, and all of those blood vessels are necessary because we need a ton of nutrients to build that hoof capsule that protects all of this. So uh, all of those blood vessels go to the coriums. And so a corium is a sensitive structure that creates corn. Um, so each of the se separate structures of the hoof have a separate corium that produces it. Um, so we have the, the sole, obviously. And so the solar corium is down here. And it's basically made up of thousands of tiny little finger-like projections. And each of those little fingers creates a little horn tubule and all of those horn tubules fit together and create that sole that we see from the bottom of the foot. Um, the same goes for the frog. It has the frog corium and it, it also is creating all that nice strong frog tissue to help protect it. Um, then we have the, uh, the hoof wall. So the hoof wall is grown from this, um, this corium that you can see right up here, the coronary corium. Uh, so you can kind of see in this image all these little, it just looks like fuzz up there, you know? And the fuzz is all of those little tiny finger-like projections that are creating your nice strong hoof capsule to uh, to protect all of this. Um, and then there's another, the, the periopal is essentially like your cuticle. So it's a very small, thin layer that covers the top edge of the hoof wall. So we can't see the corium for it in this picture because it's covered up by the hair. Um, but you would also have a little corium for that. Um, as we talked about a little bit with the, when we talked about the coffin bone, there is a corium that creates the white line and that goes right here along the bottom edge of the coffin bone. Um, and then these stripes that you see going this way, that is the sensitive lamina. So on the inside of your hoof capsule, there's insensitive lamina and then it fits together like a zipper with these sensitive lamina. So that is what holds your hoof capsule on um, and holds it in place. And that's the structure that is damaged if you do have laminitis. Um, so why does all of that anatomy matter to us? Um, the biggest thing that, that we need to take away from those slides is that the hoof capsule is not just a block of wood that's um, you know just on the end of the horse's leg and we can do whatever we want with it. It is a capsule that is protecting tons and tons of sensitive structures that can be damaged. Um, and we, we need that protective covering to be functioning at its best. Um, so the hoof is created to be uh, elastic and dynamic. So elastic meaning that it can move and then spring back to its former position. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about some of those shock absorbing mechanisms where the back half of the hoof capsule opens and then closes again. Um, so when it's bearing weight, it can push apart and help uh, absorb a little of that shock. And then when your horse moves forward off of it, that those heels just close back up. Um, but it is also dynamic. So it's got a certain point at which that force is going to be past what it can spring back from. Um, so it will at that point start distorting. So that's kind of what we're seeing in these images here. Um, something like this, you would assume came from some uneven weight bearing. So the whole hoof is distorting towards the outside and it's doing that to compensate for excessive forces that are being placed on it. 
um, same thing with this, where these heels are coming in really tight. And then you can see um, these heel bulbs are squishing together and you've got a really small crack going down here. All of that is compensating for force. Um, you know, what forces in particular are causing the problem is going to vary from horse to horse. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but there is, uh, the more that we have to compensate for things and the more that the hoof capsule sort of gives, the more that those structures inside are going to be stressed. So when you're looking at something like this, it's easy to just say, oh, wow, you know, there's a lot of flare on there. But when you think about those structures inside that, you know, that coffin bone that's in there, those blood vessels, all of those coriums that are in there, now they're getting all kinds of uneven pressure. You know, the, on this side, the coffin bone is going to be getting pressure going this way. And then on this side, it's going, the hoof wall is prying it away from the coffin bone. So there's just a ton of, uh, stresses and strains that are going into those sensitive structures. Um, so what we need to be aware of as well is that the hoof is constantly changing. Um, it's growing very, very slowly. You know, you don't see it every day, um, but it is constantly growing just like, you know, your hair, your fingernails and anything else. Um, and most horses grow about an average of three eighths of an inch of hoof uh, per six weeks. So um, whatever that comes out to a half an inch per month. Um, and then how that growth happens is going to depend on your horse's conformation. So if you have a relatively even conformation, you're going to get relatively even growth. This horse grew a little bit more toe than heel, which is fairly typical for a lot of horses that we see. Um, but as these, even if it's growing down pr pretty evenly, um, as it gets longer and longer, your base of support is shifting forward. So as you know, when this horse was probably done last, his heel was probably here. As it grows forward, now your base of support is somewhere around here. So when you think about weight bearing, you know, the weight of the whole horse is above this and it's coming down at a, a point approximately here. If you drop a plumb line from his shoulder. So the further forward that this shifts, the more pressure is being put on these heels and the more that toe is going to go forward. I'm um, sorry, we're not seeing the illustration. Okay, um, let's see. Are you seeing any illustrations now? No, I'm just seeing you. Okay, um, is the screen sharing still on? Like, are you still seeing the... Um, the slides? Oh, I, I can really can. I can, I can see, see it. all of it. I can see the illustration and the photos. Yeah, oh, I, I can see it as well. OK. Um, if you're so, not so. seeing it, can we suggest that you might um, look around the top of your screen and just make sure that you are not just looking at the speaker and that you're able to see the presentation? I, I didn't even touch the phone and it switched over to you instead of the oh. that's weird uh, yeah huh. let's see I'm pushing all the <laughs> I'm so sorry oh that's okay I'm I'm just glad that someone else is having the first technological issue because I'm going to have one at some point so yeah, Heather and I even did a dry run to make sure we that we did. Were. <laughs> okay, I might have to just watch the video when you guys replay it because I don't know what I did wrong here. Or you but might what, be able to just um, log out and then log back in, like follow the link again. Okay, I'll try that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank Sorry. All right. All righty. Um, 
Yeah, hopefully, hopefully that works. Um, so, uh, getting back, getting back to the slide. Um, so, if we, what we want is for the bones to be aligned correctly in the, in the hoof capsule, and then moving upward throughout the leg. Um, so, if the, the bones are evenly aligned, that means that even pressure is being placed on all of these joint surfaces. Nothing is taking more than its fair share of the load. And then that's also typically, if we have a, a straight axis between these bones, it means that the deep flexor tendon that goes up the back and the extensor tendon that goes up the front are in uh, balance, basically. Um, so when we have a foot that distorts forwards, especially something like these, um, that deep flexor tendon now has to work harder because there's a longer lever out in front. So if you're a tendon that's back here and you have to pull this whole thing up, the longer this lever is, the harder it's going to have to work to create that forward motion. Um, so what we shoot for is maintaining the straight axis here. And a lot of times as farriers, obviously we don't have x-ray vision, unfortunately. Um, and most of the time, if there's not an issue, we can't have a vet there every time taking a radiograph for us so we can see exactly how these bones are aligned. So what we typically look for is we know that in a undistorted foot, the coffin bone and the hoof capsule should be aligned. So this line should be parallel with this line. Um, so if this line that we can see on the outside of the hoof roughly matches what we're seeing here in the, the way that the pasterns are going, then we can say, all right, they're probably pretty, the bones are probably pretty well aligned here. Um, obviously that is not a super specific measurement. It's not like we can say, yes, for sure. These are, you know, there's zero degrees of change as you go through here, but it is a good um, sort of uh, rule of thumb for guessing if you're if you're close. So you could see on a foot like this, where you have a very low angled foot, and the pasterns are very upright, that we know we're not going to have a straight axis here, which uh, we call a hoof pastern axis, because you're looking at the hoof and then the pastern. Um, so in that case, um, obviously, if you don't have the hoof to work with, you might have to get into shoes or something like that. But our goal is going to be to raise the angle of this hoof. And then as that angle goes up, you're going to get a little bit of a lower pastern angle, which is appropriate for this horse. It should be, it should be a little lower. Uh, and they'll sort of come into alignment. They'll start to match each other better. Um, and then throughout the cycle, it's going to grow more toe than heel, and it's going to continue to lower the angle so that when we come back and trim it, we're trying to, again, get back to that better alignment. Um, the opposite, of course, would be a club foot. A club foot is going to grow a lot more heel than it will toe. And so by the end of the cycle, this coffin bone is going to be pointing down more. The hoof wall is going to be very straight, but the pasterns will be dropped back. Um, so then in that case, we're going to trim a little bit more heel than toe. And then the, uh, the pastern angle will go up just a little bit. The hoof angle will go down just a little bit as we trim off some of that heel. And they'll come back into better alignment. And then the horse starts growing as soon as we stop trimming it. Um, and it starts going back towards that. So that's uh, part of the reason that it's very important to maintain a good shoeing schedule. Uh, because they are constantly growing out of balance. Um, so as far as stopping distortion, we can't prevent um, the the hoof from growing. That's We want the hoof to grow. Some hooves just don't grow evenly. So our best tool um, to prevent that sort of distortion and damage is to keep a horse on a regular trimming or shoeing cycle. Um, six weeks is a good average uh, for that. Um, there are going to be some exceptions. Um, certainly during the summer when horses feet are growing really fast, uh, we have some horses that we do on a four week schedule because they are just excessive growers and they will get 
very distorted um, and you know start tripping and everything by the end of that cycle. So our best option is to shorten that cycle up a little bit. Um, and it's possible that you know during the winter when they are not growing very much, maybe they're out on uh, frozen ground and they're wearing off more foot. You know, maybe you can go a little bit longer than a six week, you know, maybe an eight week cycle, but in general, a six week is a good average cycle to stay ahead of that sort of distortion. Um, so then at each trimming or shoeing appointment, uh, your farrier is going to be addressing uh, any flares that might have happened, any uneven wearing, um, any imbalance. So um, they're going to kind of prevent that from escalating. So we have to think, it's just like um, like if you have a tree that you're trying to get to grow in a you know nice straight trunk or something, if you let it tip over a little bit when it's a sapling, the weight of that tree is going to continue to pull it over and you're going to end up with a very crooked tree by the end of its, you know, by its maturity. Um, however, if you do small corrections and keep it from getting so far out of whack, it's going to um, create a, a stronger structure over time. Um, one thing that we don't always think about is uh, the weight bearing. So if, if your horse is growing unevenly or they are wearing unevenly, um, eventually that weight bearing is going to shift as we talked about on the previous slide. What that does is when there's excessive weight on one of those coriums that we talked about that is helping grow the hoof capsule, excessive weight doesn't allow the same sort of blood circulation that we have in a healthy hoof. Um, so if we have reduced blood supply to one of the coriums, we're also going to have reduced hoof growth. Uh, and then that reduced hoof growth means that the um, let's say it's in the heels, the toe is going to continue to grow at its normal point. Well, now our angle is getting lower and lower, and that's just placing more pressure on the heels. So it is a self-fulfilling cycle. Um, so one of the things about having a nice, you know, six-week cycle or something like that is that we can prevent that sort of, uh, that weight bearing getting out of hand. We can get it back to normal and let some normal growth happen rather than letting it just continue to distort and put pressure there and prevent growth and then it gets worse and then there's less growth. Um, so correcting weight bearing as soon as, as soon as it starts getting out of whack is um, going to prevent that disparity in blood supply. Um, so a 2016 study uh, that looked at shoeing cycles um, Basically, at the end, they recommended that regular four to six week farrier intervals for the optimal prevention of excessive loading of the palmar limb structures. So that's the, um, the basically the back half of the foot uh, reduces long term injury risks through cumulative excessive loading. So what that's basically saying is that through their study, they found that um, if we have horses that are on a long cycle, those structures are being stressed and getting uh, cumulative excessive loading. So just repeated repeated stresses that they aren't supposed to be bearing. Um, and that puts them at a higher risk for long-term injuries, um, like tendon injuries and uh, you know suspensory ligament damage, et cetera. Um, So uh, some of the risks that we have, uh, all that increased leverage. So you can see very clearly in a foot like this, you're going to have your weight bearing in the heel starts about here. So your whole base of support is way out here. Um, so all of that pressure, this weight bearing coming down the leg is so far behind the heel. All of the weight is being borne on this poor crushed weak section of the horn, all this nice strong toe section up here is not even being used. Well, barely being used. Um, so this is, hoof is going to have a really hard time growing heel because it's just being under so much weight all of the time. Um, and then we're also getting quite a lot of stress on the deep flexor tendon because it's going down the, the back of the leg here and it's trying to pull this foot. There's so much toe out here that all of that leverage um, just makes the deep flexor tendons job so much harder. And if you remember that tiny little navicular bone in there, 
now that deep flexor tendon has to pull a lot harder, it's putting a lot more pressure on that delicate little bone in there. Um, so if we do get tendon injury or we do get um, imbalance stresses in the joints, that can do damage that, that we may not be able to fix. Um, so prevention is, is far, far better than trying to fix it. Um, and then one other aspect of a long cycle is that if your farrier is only seeing your horse, you know, every 12 weeks or something, it might delay the early detection of a lot of these hoof diseases that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, because obviously you're looking at your horse's feet, you're picking out your horse's feet regularly, but you may not have seen certain diseases if you're lucky. You know, you may not have ever experienced a horse with laminitis or white line disease. Um, so you might not recognize the signs, whereas uh, a trained full-time farrier is going to have seen quite a few examples of those. So they'll be able to spot those symptoms sooner. And with a lot of these things, um, just like with just like with human diseases, early prevention or early detection is is really helpful as far as having a good outcome. So one way that we can we can help with that early detection as a horse owner is um, consistent and thorough hoof picking. So consistent, I would like to see people picking out their horse's feet every time that they see their horse, frankly. Um, and being thorough as far as getting all of the stuff out of that foot so that you can really see what's going on. So obviously if you're looking at, um, you know, if that's your view of the bottom of your horse's foot, you're really not going to know. I mean, there could be a giant rock in there. They could have stepped on a nail like that. That's just a giant mystery right there. Um, even with that. So we've, we've picked it out and you might be tempted to say, OK, like I know there's no big rocks in there. I know there's no nail in there, but there's still quite a lot of shavings packed in here in the central sulcus and here in the either side of the frog, the collateral sulcuses. So when you're done picking it out, you should be able to see the bottom of all of these structures. So you know for sure there's nothing in there and you've helped get out any manure that might be breeding bacteria in there. Um, so at this point you have a really good assessment of the health of that foot um, and you know there's nothing, um, nothing out of the ordinary, no injuries, because even in this foot we could have a small puncture wound in here and we wouldn't know about it or we could have, you know, a small piece of wire stuck in here and you wouldn't know about it. Um, so really being thorough when you're picking out your horse's feet is going to help you spot changes and spot any sort of um, foreign objects or things that could be causing injuries. Um, so there is a ton of benefits to hoof picking. I know it is not the glamorous part of horse ownership, um, but it is one of the biggest things that you can do to help your horse on a daily basis. Um, so of course we all know you know it removes any debris rocks nails anything that might be causing them pain um but we can also prevent bacterial growth and what a lot of people don't realize about bacteria or maybe don't think about is that bacteria um, grows through what's called exponential growth so each bacteria cell um, when it is ready to reproduce it splits into two so you might start out with one cell then one reproductive cycle later, you're going to have two cells. Those turn into four cells, eight cells. You can see how quickly that could multiply. So a lot of people question, should I, is it really worth picking out my horse's feet right now if I'm then going to, you know, ride in a wet, muddy arena or turn them back out into the mud? Anytime that you pick out your horse's feet and you get rid of even if you get rid of half of the bacteria in your horse's foot, you are then creating, you're, you're basically resetting the clock on that bacterial growth. You're turning back the time. So, uh, you know, maybe you had, maybe you had a thousand bacteria. Well, if you can pick out your foot and get rid of half of that, now you're back to 500 and you've given yourself some time to, uh, to prevent that bacterial growth. Um, a lot of the bacteria that affects hooves, so like your thrush bacteria, um, the bacteria that is involved in white line disease, uh, they are 
anaerobic. So that means that exposure to oxygen kills those bacteria. So picking out your horse's feet, you know, even if you if you're dealing with a little bit of thrush, picking out frequently and letting some oxygen get to that uh, is the best thing that you can do for it. Um, again, picking out feet uh, allows you to observe the feet, the hoofs frequently. And so you'll know, you'll realize if there's a difference, if something's changing. Um, it can also prevent sole pressure from packed in dirt uh, so that a lot of horses, um, especially if they're out in sort of wet, wet dirt or uh, limestone or sand, it can pack in there and basically become like a chunk of concrete. If you've ever had to pick out one of those feet, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you probably thought you were going to break your hoof pick, uh, but that kind of pressure is not great pushing on that sole all the time. Um, and it's also, it's good for your relationship with your horse, because when you think about a horse's psychology, like a horse is a prey animal in the wild. Their job is to run away from danger. If, if a, you know, mountain lion jumps out at a horse, it's supposed to take off as fast as it can and get out of there. Um, so they are, they are fight or flight, and they definitely tend towards the flight part of that. Um, so for them to allow somebody to handle their feet, they're giving you all of their trust because they're saying, I cannot run away from danger right now. So I know that you are going to keep me safe while I, while we do this. Um, so it's, it's really for them to allow you to hold up their feet, especially for, you know, more than a few seconds is, is really a demonstration of their trust in you. Um, and it helps keep your horse in practice for the farrier. So, being that this is this is basically a trust fall from your horse, this is a, a big trust exercise. Um, if they never do it in the six weeks in between your farrier sees them, and then this person that you know they see relatively infrequently asks them to do it, they're going to have some questions. They're not going to be really excited about this process. If you do it all the time with them and they are 100% comfortable with it, then they're going to be a lot better for your farrier as well. Um, and if they are good for your farrier, it it really helps your farrier do quality work on your horse. If your horse is wiggling around, if your horse is worried about what's happening and they're always trying to pull their foot away and your farrier gets, you know, 30 seconds to work on your horse's hoof and then it's getting pulled away, it's going to be really hard for them to do their best quality work, which obviously we all want the best for, for our horse and um you want that best quality work. You want them to be able to take the time to do whatever they think is best and to do it to the best of their ability. Um, it's also, it, it can be a real safety hazard if your horse is not good at standing for the fair, even if they're not trying to be malicious, you know, even if they're just having a hard time with the patience of standing there, you know, they're, they're wiggly. A lot of young horses have a hard time um, just focusing for that long. Even that, if they're trying to walk away while your farrier is underneath them, like this is a very, a very exposed position here. If this horse tries to jerk forward, you know, if you have something here that's pulling you this way and you're leaning forward, it's very easy to lose your balance. Um, if your farrier falls or, you know, trips or something like that, that spooks your horse. Um, it can pose a danger to your horse, your farrier, and you or whoever is in the area, you know, holding your horse or whatever. Um, and remember, this is the, the farrier that is working on your horse by necessity has very sharp tools, objects that are dangerous to your horse if if your horse is flying around and, you know, like the this is a, this farrier's tool cart right off of the side here. But if if this horse crashes over into this tool cart, you know, that, that could be an extremely dangerous situation for your horse. So you do want to make sure that they are standing nice and quietly and peacefully. Um, and frankly, it's it's way less stressful for your horse if they are comfortable with this whole process. Um, and it helps keep your farrier happy. Um, if you have a farrier that you like and you've ever had to look for a new farrier, you know how stressful that situation is. Um, just the same as when you lose your uh, lose your doctor that you really like for yourself. It's it's really hard to uh, find somebody that you trust with with such an important part of your life. Um, 
So keeping that farrier when you have them um, is very important. And having a well-behaved horse that is a pleasure to work on is going to be a huge part of that, um, that whole scenario. Um, so what if your horse is not, not quite the ideal um, patient at the moment? That does not mean that that always has to be how they are. This is definitely something you can work on and improve just like every other training aspect of, uh, of your horse. I mean, your horse also didn't know how to wear a saddle when they first, uh, when they were born. Um, so it's all, it's all just learned behavior. Um, and you can definitely work on this in between your farrier appointments and your farrier will really appreciate that. Um, so the, one of the big things that you can do is when you're picking out the feet, um, try holding them like your farrier holds them, put them on the front foot, put their front foot in between your legs, um, and just hold it up. Um, when you're doing the hinds, pick it up and uh, set it on top of your legs. You can get your farrier to show you a good body position for that. Um, because it does take a little bit of practice to figure out those body positions, but that will help your horse become familiar and comfortable with those specific positions because it is a little different than how most of us just pick out a foot. Um, and then kind of go through the motions as far as trimming or shoeing. If your horse um, is really anxious when the farrier is nailing up shoes, for instance, you can get a, a small, get your hoof pick and just um, tap on the shoe when you pick it out. Just having that little bit of concussion will make them realize, okay, this is not the end of the world. This is not painful. Um, nothing bad is happening to me. And then they're going to be more willing to work with the farrier when the farrier comes and starts tapping on their feet. They're going to understand that it's less of a threat. Um, and then if, you're, if your horse has trouble, you know, bringing their feet forward for the farrier, uh, that's a lot of horses kind of struggle with that at first. Just practice stretching your horse's limbs forward. Um, and that's good for them as an athlete as well. Um, like we would never ask a human athlete to go do something without stretching out first. Um, but we ask our horses to do it all the time. So when you're, you know, if you're going to ride your horse, just stretch the legs forward first. Um, it's, yeah, it's good for them. And then it's good for their level of trust and experience as far as when the farrier asks them to do it. Uh, and then practicing patience is a big thing. Um, a lot of horses are just frankly bored with the process. <laughs> They're, you know, asked to stand there. If, you're, if your horse is being shod all the way around, that can take an hour and your horse's, the, the attention span is not necessarily there to stand there for an hour. Um, so obviously we all have things to do in our lives and we can't just spend all day at the barn making our horse be patient. Um, but when you have your horse in the cross ties and you're tacking up or whatever, just leave them for an extra couple of minutes. Um, if they start pawing or they're, you know, calling or basically exhibiting signs of uh, impatience, don't don't give them a treat. Don't uh, don't reward that behavior. Just wait a little while and let them uh, let them work it out in their head that they're going to have to stand there for a little while. Um, and then once they're standing quietly and patiently, then that's a good time to give them that reward. And, um, and then you can end, end that little training session. But uh, yeah, practicing that repeatedly is, is going to help build up their tolerance for being bored. Um, and then change things up. So a lot of people have a habit that they go through when they're uh, picking out their horse's feet. And that's great because it helps you uh, make sure that you're, you know, not skipping anything. But if you always ask for your horse's feet in a specific order, and then the farrier asks for their feet in a different order, for some horses that can really mess with their mind and they, they, they know that that's not the way it's supposed to work. Um, so practice, you know, if you normally do both front feet and then both hind feet, uh, instead do like a front and a hind and then a hind and a front and just keep on mixing up the order that you ask them for their feet um, because you want them to be comfortable picking up their feet in any order that they're asked uh, and then practice in different places. So this was a big one. Um, I had, I have some really lovely clients that adopted a couple of minis and these minis had not been handled in the past. Uh, they had been in a neglect situation. And so these clients were, you know, working with them constantly trying to get them ready to be 
you know, safely handled and not be stressed out by the process. And they were really, really anxious when I would be trimming them. And they were like, these minis just hadn't been trimmed a lot in the past. Once they were rescued, they had been trimmed, but, um, so they really didn't understand the process and they were not comfortable with it. Um, and they did not have the trust for humans that one would hope. Uh, and these clients were practicing picking out their feet all the time in the, in the stall, they would practice every day. And it didn't seem like the minis were really figuring it out. And, uh, then one day I came to trim them and they stood great. And I was like, what did you change? And they said, we just practiced doing it in the aisle because I always trim them in the aisle, but they were always getting their feet picked out in the stall and they did not put two and two together that they could, the, the activity that was safe in the stall was also safe in the aisle. So if you always pick out your horse's feet in one place, they may not necessarily translate that to, okay, it's safe to do this other places too. So go ahead and practice with them in different places and just change it up. You know, maybe, maybe you pick out their feet immediately when you bring them out of the field, or maybe you do it in the cross ties, or maybe you do it in the wash rack, or, you know, you can change this up in a million different ways and it will help them just come to the realization that it's okay, no matter where it happens. Uh, and then set your horse up for success when you have a, um, when you have a shoeing appointment, um, especially if your horse does kind of struggle with this sort of thing. Uh, so make sure that you are there to hold your horse or have a skilled horse holder available if necessary. Um, especially for the first appointment, it's going to be really important to have someone there that knows the horse, um, that can help the farrier know what's going on with the horse. Um, so if it's the first time that your farrier is seeing this horse, they just won't know what normal is for that horse as far as behavior and um, sort of personality. Uh, practice with your horse ahead of time, like we've been talking about. So you, you kind of know what to expect as far as what they're going to be good at and what they might struggle a little bit with. Um, if your horse has another horse that's their best friend, try to have that other horse in somewhere where the, that your horse can see them during shoeing that can really help lower the stress level. Um, if your horse is all alone in the barn and their best friends are all outside, it can really give them a lot of anxiety that you, you really don't need to be dealing with during shooting time. Um, and sort of on the same train of thought, don't schedule your shooing appointments during feeding time or turnout times. Cause all of your, all your horse is going to be thinking about is, Oh, there's food in my stall. There's food in my stall. I really need to go to my stall or, you know, all my friends are outside. I need to go outside. You don't want them to be really distracted during their, during their shoeing appointment. And then just try to keep the area that you're shoeing in quiet and peaceful. So if they're doing construction on one end of your barn, don't, don't park your horse right there. <laughs> I think we all know that one, but it's, it's good to read mind yourself sometimes. Um, and then also keep yourself calm as possible. Uh, a lot of us tend to get a little stressed out if we know that our horse might have trouble with something. We, we worry about what they're going to do. Your horse can sense when you are worried. We all know that horses definitely pay attention to what our emotions are. Um, so if you keep yourself nice and calm, they're going to see that and they're going to read into that, that it's okay to be calm right now. There's nothing scary happening. Um, and then if your horse does really have issues with shoeing, uh, have some sedation available, whether that's having the vet there to, you know, sedate if necessary, or, um, getting a prescription for Dormos Dormosedan gel, uh, which you can apply yourself. Um, it's, most of us don't like going to sedation <clears throat> because we feel like it's, it's relying on chemicals and, um, you know, it's, it's not the ideal thing, but it can help a horse that's really having trouble with the process. It can help keep them safe. It can keep the farrier safe. And over time you can wean them off it as they learn that it's okay. And it's not stressful and terrible. Um, but if every shooting experience that they have is stressful and terrible because they're, you know, freaked out the whole time, they're not going to learn anything from that either. So I would say, obviously you're not trying to like sedate them heavily enough to, that they don't remember any of this. Um, but 
taking the edge off can really help some horses learn that the process is okay. Um, so if you are looking for a farrier, if you're trying to find a farrier, it can be really challenging um, because it is a very important part of your horse's health. So you want to make sure that you're getting the best farrier that you can. Um, so try getting references from people you know. A lot of people, this is our, our first go-to. Um, you know, you have another horse friend, ask them, do you like your farrier? Um, you know, do they, do they show up on time? Do they take good care of your horse? Are they patient? Um, and it goes without saying, but look at, if you're, if you have a horse friend and you look at their horse's feet and you think that they kind of look like crap, maybe don't ask them about their farrier. <laughs> ask somebody that is, their horse is consistently sound and their horse's feet look good. Um, that's the person that you want to be asking um, for a recommendation. Um, and then you can also, the American Farriers Association website has a find a farrier page. So you can search by um, location, um, you can search by certification level, uh, and it can, if you put in, um, you know, just your home state, it will list everybody in that state and you can see their location. So you can see who might be near to you uh, and just have contact information for all of them. Um, the advantage to using something like that is that all of the farriers listed on that website um, are members of that association. So that does not mean that oh, only people listed on this site and only members of that association are good farriers. It just means that those are people that have an interest in continuing education because they have um, basically spent their money to join a continuing education association. Um, so in the US, we as farriers, we don't have to be certified or there's no standard education. Um, so you do have to question, is this person qualified? Um, so there are, there are certifications available. Um, it's not to say that only certified farriers are good farriers. There are plenty of very skilled farriers that do not have certification, um, but they are usually involved in some kind of continuing education. So just like with any of us, if you want to be really good at your job, you kind of keep up with what is being researched in that area and um, you know what other uh, skillful farriers might be asking or learning and uh, yeah, just keeping up with the continuing education is the is the really important aspect there. Um, when you are talking with a farrier, you know, you might be leaving them a message on the phone or you might be talking to them in person. Um, do be honest about your horse because everybody has different um, different things that they are willing to work with and things that they aren't. So if you have a horse that uh, maybe is a challenge to work on, you might be tempted to kind of gloss over that fact and say like, oh yeah, he's great for the farrier. If you know that he's not great for the farrier, um, please do tell the farrier uh, because you don't know what kind of health issues that farrier might be working with. Um, so for instance, I have a friend who um, was, uh, she was pregnant while she was shooing and it was very important for her not to work around a horse that might kick or, you know, be prone to that sort of behavior because obviously that, that baby was very, very important to her. Um, so uh, you might have a farrier that has some back issues that they've been struggling with and it's really important for them not to get jerked on. So for them taking on, you know, a two-year-old that hasn't had a whole lot of handling isn't going to be a good fit. They might be able to recommend to you somebody that is willing to work with that kind of behavior. Um, and do be specific about your horse, like what its needs are. Um, you know, if you've had a horse that has had chronic health issues with something, uh, it's great to let the farrier know so that they kind of have an idea of what, um, what level of care your horse might need. Um, and then again, going back to that uh, aspect of scheduling, um, find a farrier who schedules and then stick with that schedule. Uh, so a lot of people um, might think, oh, my horse's feet don't look too bad. I think I'll skip this time. And then, you know, maybe in three or four weeks, I'll call the farrier and see if we can get something booked in. Please don't do that because most farriers, especially skillful farriers are going to be very, very busy. Um, and so if you kind of lose your spot in line, it might be a while before they can get back to you. And then you go back to that 
all those issues that we were talking about with um, with everything that comes with a long schedule. Um, and when I say find a farrier who schedules, there's some farriers who schedule, uh, like they'll give you a week that it's going to be. There's some farriers who schedule down to the hour. So both of those are acceptable and everything in between. Just somebody that, that keeps your horse in a sort of uh, schedule where they know how long it's been since they've done your horse and when your horse is due next. So there are some things that are extra risk factors for your horse. Um, so confirmation can be one of those. Um, if you have a horse that has crooked confirmation, forces aren't being applied to the hoof evenly. So they might struggle more with breaking up and flaring. Um, and uneven pressure on those coriums, like we talked about earlier, means uneven growth. So the area under the most pressure is going to grow the least. So a horse like this, that's fairly bow-legged up front. For one, all of these joints are going to be getting more pressure, like this joint here is getting more compression on the inside and more stretching on the outside. So all of these ligaments that go along the joint here are all going to be under strain and the bone and cartilage that are all stacked up here are all going to be receiving a lot more pressure than they're supposed to. And the same goes as you go down the foot or up down the leg. Um, so something like that, it's going to be really important to stay on that schedule um, so that you don't have more distortion because as this hoof grows, this area is going to be under more pressure. So this is growing less. This area is going to be growing more. And as this side grows longer and longer, it's going to actually pull this whole thing in. Well, the torso of the horse is staying in the same place. And so the where the limb begins is staying in the same place. So this is going to have to bend in more from here to follow that pulling of the, of the hoof. Um, so that puts even more strain on the outside and more pressure on the inside. So hoof distortion is can be caused by confirmation, but then it can also affect the confirmation. Um, so staying on that nice tight schedule to prevent that distortion is going to help you reduce as much of that stress as you can. Um, so we also have to deal with the fact that movement isn't going to be straight if your horse's legs aren't straight. So the hoof is going to wear unevenly. Um, so, you know, this horse is wearing really hard to the outside of his toe here, and then this big chunk off here to the inside is not wearing hardly at all. Um, so he's uh, basically, this is going to keep, keep pulling it. This is getting shorter and shorter. So he's going to break over harder and harder in this direction. And it's going to make him move more unevenly, which is just going to create more uneven wear. So it is sort of a self-fulfilling cycle, um, but with regular care. We can manage this distortion and prevent it from really creating that cycle. Um, and you may, if you have a horse that really wears unevenly, you might need shoes or boots to protect the hooves. Um, basically, in that case, you're trimming as balanced as you can, and then you put that steel or that uh, or that boot on there um, to preserve that this spot that's going to be really worn away and prevent it from uh, seeing so much damage. Another uh, big risk factor that we see a lot, especially um, here in Northern Illinois where we have beautiful lush green grass is uh, metabolic conditions. So uh, some of those are um, Cushing's disease or uh, pituitary pars intermediate disorder. Um, so that is essentially a um, an issue with the pituitary gland where it's not working correctly and it's producing too much of one hormone and um, we end up seeing isolated fat pockets so your horse might be even skinny or of a normal weight but have big fat pockets in some areas um, a curly hair coat is one of the really uh, very noticeable symptoms of Cushing's disease and one of the things that should really if your horse goes from having nice smooth flat hair to a curly hair coat that's something that you should really take notice of um, and then not shedding out normally is another uh, very indicative sign of Cushing's disease um, 
And then insulin dysregulation, so that kind of covers uh, insulin resistance, um, hyperinsulinemia, all of those types of conditions. Um, you might see symptoms like weight gain that doesn't really seem to match feeding and exercise. So maybe you're not feeding very much. They're not getting a ton of food and, you know, you might be working the horse, but they seem to just be gaining weight no matter what. Um, some of those really easy keeper type of horses. Um, and you might see what seems like stiffness, especially on the front legs where, um, they'll just, they come out a little, a little shuffly and they don't really want to extend and they're just not moving quite normally. Um, or you might also see directly, you might see hoof pain. Um, and then obesity is a huge factor for, uh, for metabolic conditions in general. Um, and it can be hard to, hard to tell exactly where your horse is at weight wise. Uh, so that's where the Henneke body condition scoring system comes in. It's a really easy to use, um, easy to use system. It's a lot more, I feel accurate than like, if you use a weight tape, you have to make sure you put it in the exact same spot every time. They're not necessarily accurate as far as the pound that's written on there may not be the pound that your horse actually is if you put them on a scale. Um, it might be able to tell you if they're losing weight or gaining weight, but the specifics aren't quite there. Um, the Henneke body scoring condition, it basically goes through scoring specific areas on the horse. So like the, the crest of the neck is one, um, the withers in the area behind the shoulder, like the fat covering of the ribs, and then like the tail head is one. Um, so they go through specific descriptions of each of those areas. Um, so you kind of can read through those descriptions and see which one matches your horse most closely. Uh, and you, you want to be kind of in the middle of the range, um, uh, four to six, I think it's a scale of basically one to 10. Um, but you can find that, uh, that scoring system easily online just by Googling it. It's very, very helpful. Um, so all of those conditions that we just talked about, they do carry a huge risk of laminitis. And, um, we all know that laminitis is really, really scary and really a bad deal for horses. Um, According to some studies, 20% of horses who experience a laminitic attack never recover, even to pasture soundness. So we do need to take it very, very seriously. Um, but all of these conditions on the last page are treatable or manageable. Um, some of them, like Cushing's disease, you can't, you can't fully get rid of, but there are medications available that will help manage those symptoms and manage the side effects. Um, insulin resistance and uh, insulin dysregulation in general, that can often be managed or even uh, cured through uh, diet and exercise. Um, and obviously obesity, the same, like you can, you can get rid of that. Um, it's certainly hard work, but you certainly can. Uh, that said, if you suspect any of these conditions or you suspect that your horse is having a laminitic episode, uh, definitely do call your vet. If you suspect a laminitic, laminitic episode, you should consider it a veterinary emergency. Um, as far as the, if you suspect any of those conditions, that would be definitely something to discuss with your vet. It's not necessarily a, uh, you know, emergency, call them out on a weekend sort of situation. Um, so another risk factor that, uh, that we see often, especially if you're working with uh, a horse that's been rescued is, um, horses that have suffered from neglect. So if you adopted a horse who was neglected in the past, um, you just have to keep an eye on some things that horses that have always been cared for may not have to deal with. Uh, so we do see a lot of improper weight. Um, primarily we see extremely skinny horses. Occasionally you'll see a very, very fat horse, uh, that's been rescued with the skinny horses. Obviously our goal is to get them up to a good body weight. But we have to be really careful when we're feeding up that that we do it in a very controlled manner. Um, the shock to the system essentially uh, can actually kick off laminitis just from going from having no food and no extra calories to going to basically a huge spike in their blood sugar because they're just their body just won't be used to processing what we would consider normal amounts of food. So you do want to talk to 
a nutritionist or a vet about a good refeeding schedule um, if you do have a horse that is very skinny. Um, and then we also do have to deal with trust issues on a lot of neglected horses, uh, especially if they were abused or mistreated. It's They can really have some issues dealing with people. And it's also important to remember that they are going to learn to trust you that they're seeing all the time faster than they're going to learn to trust your farrier. So you're going to have to really focus on those things that we talked about, about working with horses feet and making sure that they trust you to handle their feet and then helping them trust a stranger to handle their feet. Um, so again, one of the things that we can do is practice stretching horses feet forward. That can be one of the really, really challenging things for a horse that does not trust a person to do. Um, this horse was in no way neglected or abused. This is just an illustration of stretching feet forward to be clear. Um, so going through those motions of that your, that your farrier is going to go through, stretching feet forward, um, holding their feet underneath them with, you know, holding them between your legs, all of those things are going to be really helpful for that. And then we also have to deal with the fact that they may have had improper or completely non-existent hoof care. Um, so in a wet environment with soft ground, horses really don't self-trim well. Um, so their feet might become excessively long and then start to break off. Um, if you're in a drier environment or a abrasive environment, they will probably, probably keep up with wearing their feet down in a more controlled way. Um, and as we talked about earlier, with all of those sensitive internal structures in the hoof, you might end up with damage being done to those internal structures if they were neglected for a long period of time and they had extreme stress. So in a situation like this, where the horse's feet were just allowed to be truly excessively long, um, there's going to be a huge amount of stress on all the sensitive structures inside there, um, all of the tendons that are involved. So you're going to have to be aware of that going forward, that you may not be working with 100% healthy structures even once this foot is gotten back to normal. Um, and to, to work with something like this, you're going to need to have some pretty frequent trimming. Um, so trimming, trimming this horse, you know, every eight weeks, you're never going to get ahead of this, or it's going to be very difficult to get ahead of this. Um, when I have a horse uh, that has been rescued or something that has feet like this, I honestly, I prefer seeing them every four weeks and it really lets you get ahead of this growth and distortion because this is not going to be able to all be trimmed off back to normal in one cycle. Um, for one thing, the, uh, the blood supply and the sensitive structures inside here are going to be distorted and they're going to be pulled forward further than what we would expect to see in a normal healthy foot. Um, so if we trim this foot to where we think it should be, we might end up getting into some of those sensitive structures and that's something that we never want to do. Um, so something like this is going to take a lot of time and quite a few farrier visits and a lot of patience. Um, but it is, it is something where this, um, this horse could, you know, go on to live a healthy and happy life. Um, so if you want to know more about any of these topics, um, if you are interested in learning more about anatomy, um, Anatomy of the Equine is a company that uh, you can easily search them online. And I think we're going to have a, uh, a resource list that we'll be able to email out after this. Um, but they have uh, beautiful books and they also have a complete online course that goes through all kinds of anatomy. Um, they have really, their books are, I, I absolutely love them. Um, they do these beautiful dissections and then take very, very good pictures of them. Um, so they've got one book that's just uh, sort of normal anatomy, and then they've got one that's about like distorted feet, so flares and cracks and all kinds of stuff like that. And then they've got one that I absolutely love that's about laminitis. And they do like side-by-side -side comparisons where they'll have a healthy hoof, and then they'll have the laminitic hoof, and then they'll have, you know, the inside of that hoof, and then they'll have the inside of the laminitic hoof. And it, it really helps you see what some of the differences are and what some of the changes are that you might see and what's going on inside when you see some distortions on the outside. So I would highly recommend any of those, um, 
any of those books, especially if you are dealing with some laminitis on your own. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about uh, hoof functions and hoof diseases, uh, this book, Understanding Horses' Hooves by John Stewart. Um, I really enjoy this book and it has, I think, excellent descriptions of both um, the anatomy of feet and why, why a lot of those things are the way that they are. And then um, really his section about uh, laminitis, I think is really top notch. It covers uh, really in depth sort of how, um, how things like Cushing's disease and insulin resistance and obesity on a molecular level, how that's going to uh, cause changes in your horse's hoof. Um, and his, uh, his navicular disease section is also really, really good. Um, and then if you uh, are just interested in learning more about hooves and farriery in general, uh, the American Farriers Association does have a horse owner membership. Um, so that is uh, on the American Farriers Association website, you can find all the details about the um, all the benefits involved with membership. But uh, the one of the big ones is that you get our newsletter, which has um, educational articles and case studies and all kinds of uh, things that are really interesting if you're a little bit of a hoof nerd like I am. Um, and uh, there are also a number of other member benefits like uh, discounts at like John Deere and uh, Sherwin Williams and stuff like that. Um, and then this is uh, my book that I just wrote. It's uh, if you enjoyed what, what we talked about today, it's uh, kind of all that stuff is in here and then in more detail. Um, so I just tried to write this book for basically all the questions that, that horse owners have about um, horses' feet. So uh, this is available on Amazon, as Jen said. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we just launched it um, on Thursday and it's, it's doing really well so far. So I'm really pleased with that. Uh, but yeah, if you are interested, that is available on Amazon as well. But this is not like Girl Scout cookies. We can still be friends even if you don't buy it. Um, so thank you very much to Haas for hosting this. And I know their next couple of sessions are going to be really good. I'm, I'm going to tune in for those too. Um, and thank you for all of you that came and listened today. And that, that is all I got. So let me see if I can switch this back over to Jen. Let's see. All right, Jen, do you have it now? I okay. believe I do. So does anyone have any questions? I think there were a couple of questions in the chat here. I haven't, uh, haven't, I wasn't looking at the chat while I was presenting, but let me no, open that's, this real that's quick. Okay. Um, oh. So Mary does have a question. For okay. neglected horses with really long hooves, do they need to be kept in dry lots? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, for me, it would depend on what else is going on with the horse. So if the horse is also suffering from some laminitis due to those really long hooves, which that is a big risk factor, um, then I would say, yes, a dry lot would be a great option because then you can control exactly what they're eating. Um, same goes for if they are extremely skinny and you're trying to refeed them in a responsible way, um, that yes, a dry lot would be a great option for making sure that they are getting the appropriate amount of food. They're not getting too much food. They're not getting too little food. Um, if they are perfectly healthy, aside from having really long neglected hooves, uh, then I would say it would probably be all right to let them have be in a, in a grassy area. Um, if they, if their feet are still very long and they, you know, you haven't had a chance to get them trimmed yet, or they are, in process of being trimmed, but they still have a lot of leverage on there. I would avoid giving them a large area where they could really run around um, because you don't want them straining themselves. Essentially, those uh, those tendons are going to be under a lot of stress. Um, so, you know, not putting them in with another horse that's going to chase them around is going to be a good call. <laughs> um, uh, 
as far as exercises, um, are you talking about exercises for like trimming and stuff? Or are you talking about exercises as far as like getting them back in shape? And please feel free to unmute yourselves and answer and we can. Oh, yeah. Directly. Yeah. Okay. So, no, I was thinking, you know, like um, years and years ago at Haas, we got in a bunch of minis that had really long, like elf hooves. Okay. And they got trimmed and um, they were, um, you know, I was just wondering if, you know, are there special, you know, I mean, their, their weight's been on the wrong side of their hooves for so long, you know, is there anything to do to, to help, you know? Oh, these... you mean as far as like trying to get them as their, as their feet are getting into shape, is there things that you can do to like help them yeah, regain their strength in the right direction? <laughs> right, right. Um, I would say, um, and I, it's kind of on the spot, but um, I would say, starting out slow with them is definitely going to be going to be a big thing especially uh when we're talking about um you know a full-size horse that you might be interested in riding or something like that at some point don't do anything beyond a walk while their feet are not in good shape and yeah as you say getting them getting them fit it's not a overnight thing um just like we aren't going to fix their feet overnight uh if they have not, if they've been, you know, neglected, they're not going to be ready to go out on a six hour trail ride or something like that. You're going to be talking, you know, nice slow walks in hand at first and then working your way up slowly. But uh, that's going to be to some extent based on the rest of their body condition and what sort of shape they were in when they were rescued. Um, but yeah, taking it easy and starting off slow is going to be going to be a good move in general. I have a question about, um, I haven't had horses since I was a kid and I'm adopting a pony in April that that's coming in April. She nice. has a history. She's been in the rescue um, for I think over a year and they've gotten her issues under control, but she had a history of neglect of not being fed properly, not having her hooves cared for properly, founder, laminitis, etc. Okay. Um, she seems to be doing really well right now, and I, you know, I've listened to everything you've said about getting her on a good schedule, and um, you know, we're not going to let her free graze and just trying to learn everything that she needs. Yeah. She, um, so in general, I wanted to ask what your advice would be to plan for her coming in, and then she comes with a little, a pair of little boots for her, just her front hooves. Okay. And if you have any advice for how to manage that, because I've heard. I've heard things about, you know, they should not be wearing the boots all the time, but if she needs the boots for support, like, I don't know how to, how to fi figure out the best way to, to use the boots. Absolutely. Um, do you know off the top of your head, are those uh, soft ride boots by chance? Uh, I don't know. They're, I think it's Cavallo. Is it, okay. I don't know how to pronounce it, but. Yeah. Um, There's a number of boots that are, are good for that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So we, uh, we do use boots a lot with, um, especially ponies and minis um, that have had some laminitis. Uh, there's a lot of these boots um, are nice and soft and cushioned on the inside. And then they also have um, what's called a frog support in there. So it's transferring some of the load off of the hoof wall, which is what's going to be under the most stress in laminitis and transferring it onto the frog, which is typically um, a nice healthy structure. Uh, so that's probably where the boots are coming from in some, at least that would be my guess. Um, yes, you are hundred percent right. They should not be on 24 seven. Um, so what I typically recommend is if you have a stall that your horse can go in, um, then we can, what we'll do is have the boots on when they go out. Um, because that's where you're going to be in the most sort of uncontrolled environment. As far as that goes, um, you know, they're going to be having the possibility of stepping on rocks or stepping, you know, on the edge of concrete or all kinds of silly things that horses do. Um, so, and that's when they're most likely to be running around, not necessarily paying attention to how their feet are feeling. Um, 
So what we usually recommend is to have the boots on when they're outside. And then when you bring your pony in, take those boots off and pick out the feet, clean them nicely, make sure they're nice and dry in there. And then um, have the stall uh, on the deeply bedded side. So having plenty of shavings in there um, will help cushion her feet a little bit anyway. Um, so then you can let everything dry out, make sure that the boots are clean. Um, when you pull those boots off, just double check. Uh, typically it's kind of in the heel bulb region. If it's going to happen, they might get um, rubs where basically just part of the part of the boot is a little snug or is rubbing uh, as they're running around. Um, if that does happen, you can uh, either add some sort of cushioning to the inside of the boot in that area. Um, like some people use fleece if there's like sort of a sharp edge, they can kind of wrap a piece of fleece around it or um, felt, something like that. Um, or you may need to uh, pick a different size or a different brand of boot. If that's the type of boot that's been working for her though, I would assume that it's probably going to fit well. Um, but yeah, that would be my recommendation as far as boots go. Thank you. Is there is there more of a risk for them getting thrush if they're wearing the boots too much? Like to, if their feet, I don't know if they hold the moisture in. Um, it kind of depends on the brand of boots. I know that there there is a wide variety. Um, some of them are set up to sort of allow a little more airflow than others. Um, but yes, you do want to make sure that that you are getting that frog nice and picked out every time that you pull it off because you do want that frog to stay healthy, especially if she has had some laminitis since that's that's one of the good structure structures in her foot that hasn't been affected by the laminitis. So you want to keep it healthy. Um, yeah, but yeah, really keeping helpful. a keeping a close eye on that is going to be good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else have a question? Well, I think I have one. What is the most dramatic case that you have encountered? Um, and I guess the second part of that would be, or a case where you've seen the most improvement. Um, so for me personally, I guess the most dramatic case that I've encountered, unfortunately it's been, there's a couple of them, but they've been neglected minis where, um, as the last person just said, they, they get those elf toes and, um, it's, it, it's very upsetting when you see people letting that happen to these nice little, nice little animals. But, um, but the great thing about those minis is that like, it's, it's truly remarkable. Like they'll have these curled up little elf toes, everything in that hoof is horribly distorted and stressed and they come back from it, which is, it's really their capacity to heal is really remarkable. And I think part of that is, well, a being removed from their former environment and being brought into a situation where they are being cared for properly. But then B, the fact that they have, um, like they're just smaller animals. So there's just less weight on those feet. Um, a full size horse, you know, you might be talking about a thousand pounds on those feet. And with a mini, you might be talking about a couple hundred. Um, so they're, uh, they do have, I think, better odds of surviving things that many horses <laughs> would die from. Um, but yeah, they are, they are remarkably, um, yeah, they're remarkable little animals. So, um, yeah, I would say, I would say minis have been mostly the, the most extreme and biggest comebacks I've seen too. Okay, great. Um, we are, so I have a question. And hopefully, there we go. So this is your contact information, yep. different methods that people can get a hold of you. So who is that in the picture with you? So that was actually when I was over on the exchange program in England. Um, this is at a donkey, um, I want to say rescue, but it may have been a sanctuary. Um, and these are uh, a French breed of donkeys. And I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but it's a uh, potu donkey. 
It's basically P and then a bunch of vowels and then T and a bunch of vowels. Um, but they are a long haired giant French donkey. And they had, um, I want to say they probably had around 20 of them. And, uh, yeah, oh. this was, this was one of the donkeys there. And I just, um, yeah, I, I love them. They're so funny. They're just, yeah, the, the long hair and the giant size just cracked me up. So Mary has a question. Do donkeys and mules have the same trimming schedule as horses? And that I was a kind of question about that as well. Like different types of equines. Are there any structural differences in their hooves? Yes. Um, so to answer Mary's question really quickly first, um, I do recommend the same trimming schedule for uh, donkeys and mules as for horses. Um, obviously, as we talked about earlier, that's going to depend a little bit on the animal themselves. Um, I've known a few, well, I know one mini donkey that barely grows any foot. And so he's on a little bit of a longer schedule, but for the most part, they, um, they grow a, a normal amount of foot as you would see for a horse or a pony. Um, and then to answer your question, Jen, there are some structural differences. Uh, they tend to have uh, really straight um, sides of their hooves. So a horse has like typically a, a rounded front, shoot, front shape and then a triangular kind of hind shape, whereas a donkey typically has like basically a U shape. Um, and then they, their frogs are placed further back in their hoof, where with a, a horse, we typically say that the back of the heels and the back of the frog should line up. On a donkey, those, um, those, the frog is going to be set back behind the heels. Um, and then with a mule, we basically see those same things that we see with a donkey, just slightly less so because they're crossed with a horse. Uh, and they do typically have more upright hooves than a horse would as well. Uh, right. Yeah. And then, uh, Jenny, to answer your question, I don't have any in-person events planned. Um, so ordering online is going to be the best option right now. But thank you very much. <laughs> well, we'll just have to coordinate and have you come out to Haas and maybe do a book signing or something. Yeah, it might be fun. <laughs> it would be fun. Um, so what's the most unusual environment that you have had to work in? We, you know, we, we all, I'm sure, try to keep our uh, barns and our areas conducive, but I, you know, I know I try to always bring a bottle of water because you guys are just on the well, road. That's very nice of you. <laughs> very thirsty. So what can, yes. what can we do as clients to make your job easier and you covered some of that but anything else yeah so what we mostly talked about today is um you know horse behavior which is a huge aspect um and i would way rather work on a well-behaved horse in a not that great environment than a perfectly behaved horse in a or a badly behaved horse in a perfect environment um but i do go into this a little bit in my book uh but the it's yeah it's really nice to have a clear flat area to work in um, I realize not everybody has, you know, a beautiful giant barn with perfectly poured concrete and all that stuff, but having a, a nice clear flat area without obstacles that you could trip on or um, things that the horse can pull off of the wall and throw or, you know, um, yeah, having a nice clear flat environment, having appropriate lighting is going to be a big deal because uh, if, if your farrier can't see what they're doing and they're trying to shoe by braille, it's going to be really hard for them to do their best work. Um, so if you don't have great lighting in your, whatever area you have for shoeing, um, you can easily get those, uh, contractor lights from Menards or any other hardware store and set up one of those. And that's going to be a huge help for your farrier. Um, and then making sure that any other animals in the area, whether that's horses or dogs, um, are sort of out of the shoeing area. So when I have to shoe in an environment where um, I'm shoeing in the aisle and then there's a horse that can reach out of his stall and 
fight my horse that I'm working on, that's going to be a dangerous situation for everyone involved. Um, so just making sure that if if you do have the horse that likes doing that, maybe close their stall door or put them in a different stall for the shoeing time. If you have a dog that really likes to be underfoot, I love dogs and I love petting people's dogs when I go to their barns, but I want to make sure that their dogs are staying safe as well. So I don't want them underfoot where they might get stepped on or kicked or um, some of the dogs really, really love eating horse hoof. And so they'll try to put their faces right next to the hoof while I'm trying to trim. And I don't want to accidentally whack their nose with a knife or with a rasp or anything like that. So make sure that any animals that you have on the property are sort of in appropriate locations during the shooting process. Um, and then I see a question from Jill. Uh, she says, I have two senior mares with arthritis. Do you have any advice particular to seniors? Um, yeah, so that that can be a um, challenging thing when you have a lot of arthritis going on because it's, it's not going away. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to fix arthritis, as you know. Um, so typically with, um, with my horses that I work on that have arthritis, uh, I'm very lucky because I'm a very small person. I'm five feet tall, so I can really keep horses feet quite low to the ground. Uh, but a lot of those horses that have some arthritis are going to be uncomfortable the more I flex their leg. So I try to hold them low while I'm working on them. Um, and that helps keep them a little more comfortable. And then um, as far as actually the trimming or shoeing, um, again, making sure that they are kept on a good um, good schedule where they're not getting a long foot because a long foot adds leverage and it's going to change the angle that those joints are at. So if you have arthritis, the arthritis is going to have been formed at sort of their normal angle. If you drastically change that angle, some of that, those bone spurs and things around the joint can come into contact with other parts that they wouldn't normally. Um, so we do want to avoid drastically changing things. Um, and we do want to avoid leverage on those feet. Um, so I try to uh, maintain them as balanced as I can. Um, if I do end up showing them a lot of times uh, having a um, we'll use what's called a half round section, which is basically a shoe that's rounded all the way around. Um, so that a lot of times when a horse has arthritis, they're not moving perfectly straight anymore. They move a little bit crooked as that arthritis grows. And so I wanted to make it easy for them to move whatever way they're comfortable. So having um, sort of a roll on that shoe on the edge, a little bit of a bevel, uh, that can help them a lot. Um, but yeah, uh, and some horses with arthritis are just a little uncomfortable with concussion in general. Sometimes um, putting a pad on them can be helpful. Uh, so that's just a piece of leather or plastic that goes in between the shoe and the foot. Um, so that can help reduce a little bit of that concussion just when their hoof hits the ground. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of senior horses are just maintained barefoot and then just keeping them in good balance and doing a good, uh, good bevel on that hoof is going to help them. Uh, anyone else have anything? Uh, this might be a topic in and of itself, but are there any supplements that very, should we, will we be working with our vet when it comes to supplements that might help strengthen a hoof? Should we be talking to our farrier? Should all three of us be talking? I know supplements are, you know, one of those loaded questions, but thought yeah. you might have some insight for us. Yeah, so um, so supplements are not regulated by um, the FDA or any other government body. Um, so if it's a medication, it has to go through certain strict tests and somebody is actually checking what is in it and whether it works or not. With a supplement, I could put a bunch of sawdust in a bag and say that it will make your horse fly and sell it and nobody could really stop me. Um, so you do have to be really careful that you buy your supplements from a reputable source. So there are, um, I don't remember the name of the group off the top of my head, but there is 
a group that is an independent um, independent group that checks uh, what goes into supplements and they do uh, they take samples of supplements and make sure that it actually has what they the manufacturer says is in it. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head what the name of that group is, but um, but you'll see. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Life Data Labs um, they have a seal from that group that uh, that goes on their stuff because that group has checked their stuff and says yes, this is what they say it is. Um, and I think uh, I would guess that quite a few of the other big name um, supplement makers probably have that as well. Uh, so checking that um, can be helpful. And then, yes, I would talk to honestly both the vet and the farrier. Um, to some extent, the farrier is going to be very helpful in that they can tell you um, is what you're seeing as a quality issue in your horse and your horse's hoof, is that going to be something that can be affected by supplements or is it more of an environmental thing? Um, so that can be helpful just knowing, do they think that this is going to be a waste of money or not? Because even the best supplement in the world that is exactly what the manufacturer says is, is not going to help if your horse doesn't need a supplement. <laughs> um, and yeah, your vet is gonna be a helpful person to talk to as well, I would say. Um, so yes, I would say yes to all of the above. <laughs> Ask all those people. Um, yeah. Excellent. And then this is just kind of um, one of those fun surprise questions that I decided that you're going to be my guinea pig in asking. Okay. We will ask everyone going forward. Um, okay. What was your favorite horse book as a kid? Oh, I I was an obsessive reader as a kid, so I had like a giant stack of, of horse books. Um, uh, probably um, King of the Wind. It was one of the Marguerite Hen Henry books. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I liked that one. I, I honestly read all of her books, but yes. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that one. That or one of the it. like eyewitness horse books that had all the pictures in it because I, I love those too. Yes. Those are amazing. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. That was a good surprise question. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, we need, you know, when you listen to podcasts or interviews or something, you know, yes. it's a series. They always have that surprise question at the end. I was like, I yeah. need to come up with one of those. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so, wonderful. Well, does anyone have any other questions? <laughs> Jenny, that's that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Well, I have all there. I'm very grateful that Heather took the time to join us today. And this is great fun. Slide, thank you for having me. Thank you. And, you know, we can say that we have a, a famous author among our first speakers. <laughs> We're very excited about that. And on your screen should be the information for our next seminar series episode, which will be first aid on the farm and plants that are toxic to horses. So we have that that is up on our Facebook event page. The link to register is live and we hope you will join us. We're really lucky to have two presenters. Because, you know, springtime brings out all the stuff that has wandered onto your property or into your stable yard during the winter. And these magical plants that were not there last year, your horse is like, oh, let's go take a look at those. So we're very lucky to have Dr. McCombs and Dr. Klein joining us next month. And we will post Heather's contact information in the Facebook group event discussion as well as he has very thoughtfully provided a list of resources that we'll be emailing to everyone who signed up and we'll make that available as well so please even if your friends were not able to join us today please remind them that we have recorded this and it will be posted on the Haas website and YouTube channel shortly 
anything else. All right, then I think we will say goodbye and enjoy, well, okay, the last couple of days have been beautiful and it's supposed to be nice, I understand, on Monday. But then we go back to Chicago weather. So for those of you joining us from other parts of the country, we hope you're having much nicer weather than we are. And get out there and enjoy your horses. Thank you. So that I wrote that you paid and then you're all set, okay? Thank you so you much, sorry about that.